Within the 12 minutes of this talk, 240 people will experience some form of domestic violence or abuse in the United States alone. That's 240% the number of people sitting in this auditorium right now. I still remember the sound of the footsteps running down the stairs the minute we stepped inside the house. And the yelling would begin immediately, and it was always about something I couldn't understand at the time, like money or lawyers, but nevertheless, the fighting wouldn't end. And immediately, I would run and hide in my room, and I would take breaks between homework assignments to cry or write angry words in my journal. And often, the pen would press so hard into the paper that the ink would bleed through two or three pages. And at dinner, I would sit silently, even though there was always chatter between my stepbrothers. I just couldn't bring myself to fake a smile. At night, it, it didn't really get better. Night after night, I would lie there, listening to the yelling and screaming that would stream from the kitchen into my room. And eventually, I would fall asleep, but my pillow would often be streaked with tears. And the next morning, I would get up, get ready, go to school, but I would be completely numb and the cycle would start all over again. And it became difficult to talk to my friends. I became isolated and removed from the rest of the class. And when people tried to talk to me or ask me, ask me if I was OK, I would often just snap back at them or act like everything was fine. And it eventually got so bad that my teacher took notice, and she did bring it up to my parents. But a common question people asked me after it was over was, why didn't you talk to us? Why didn't you tell us what was going on so we could support you? And they were almost hurt by the fact that I hadn't confided in them about what was going on in my life, because it seems simple, right? Just talk about it. Why don't you just talk about it? I didn't because I didn't feel like anyone would truly understand what it was that I was feeling. In fact, I knew. I mean, how could they? I doubt anyone even knew what domestic violence was. I know I didn't. And here we get to the root of the issue. How can we support teens if the majority of the population of the United States doesn't even know what domestic violence is? How can we expect people to start a conversation if no one knows what the conversation is fundamentally about? It's kind of like asking me to do a calculus problem. As a person in Algebra 2, I'm just not going to understand what it is you're asking me to do. But along with not being educated to understand the topic, there's another very good reason why people avoid it. Because it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. But that's why I'm here today, to educate you and to tell my story so that hopefully, when I'm done talking, every single one of you will be able to take initiative and seize the awkward. So what exactly is domestic violence? And you know, it's a good question because there are so many different ways I could answer that. The so-called textbook definition from the Center of Family Justice says, domestic violence is a pattern of controlling, coercive, physically and or mentally abusive behavior which is a pervasive, life-threatening crime affecting people in all the communities, regardless of age, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, social standing, and immigration status. It's an accurate definition, but I think at the end of the day, domestic violence is really when one person who, being in a relationship with another, cannot respect the other person's boundaries in any shape or form. So, raise your hand if you know or know of a teen that has talked about an experience that they've had with domestic violence, and I don't count. It's not too many. This right here is the problem. Domestic violence has been an issue in society for as long as society has existed. For decades and decades, teens have watched themselves, their mothers, and their fathers have their lives torn apart by this phenomenon. And we as a society are still standing by a scary lack of awareness on how it is affecting our families and the communities around us. But when I say lack of awareness, what exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that in the United States alone, 20 people are subject to intimate partner violence every minute. And this equates to about 10 million people every year. According to the National Healthcare Service Corporation and the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, only 33% of teens who witnessed or were in an abusive relationship ever told anyone about it. And 81% of parents feel that teen dating violence is not an issue and that it does not affect teens, or they alternately admit not knowing if it's an issue. This is now unraveling a whole other set of problems, as I'm sure you can see. 
If the adults in our society don't understand the severity and seriousness of what could be happening to their teens, then how are we supposed to feel comfortable going home and talking to our parents and family about it? And if we aren't telling anyone about it, the stigma surrounding this topic is only going to increase. And the perpetrators of this violence will feel it is okay to continue these actions, and so on and so forth. Furthermore, 82% of parents feel confident that they could recognize the signs if their child was experiencing an abusive relationship or the effects of witnessing one. Yet only 42% were actually able to correctly identify all the warning signs of abuse. Now, aside from the numerous damaging psychological effects, which I will talk about in a minute, think about what these numbers mean. In fact, they aren't just numbers. These statistics represent true emotional pain. They represent a feeling of being scared and helpless every single day. They represent a feeling of not knowing if whether while you're at school, if your mom or dad is working or being abused by their partner. Whether tomorrow they will go to the hospital with a black eye or whether they will be home cooking dinner for you. Will you come home to find your entire family has been driven out of the house or gone to court? It is these types of questions that make domestic violence one of the biggest psychological destroyers out there. But what exactly are the effects? You know, there are many, and none of them are anything anyone would ever want to experience, but one of the most prevalent of them all, or maybe the most prevalent, especially among teens, is a high correlation with a peaked rate of depression and suicidal behavior. Not only that, but teens that are experiencing an abusive relationship or the effects of witnessing one experience a severe decline in motivation, scholastic performance, and interest in activities such as music, sports, theater, etc. And teens also tend to struggle socially and they will become isolated, which often loops back into a cycle of more depression, self-harm, and suicide. So how can you as teens begin to help ease this cycle? Well, I've set up a few simple steps you could take if you suspect someone you know is going through any type of abuse or violence. Step one. Start a conversation. And believe me when I say I know, it's going to be uncomfortable. But if it's awkward, it's going to be worth it. There is absolutely nothing more helpful because you don't know where that conversation will lead, who you will help, and what you will learn. It can be as easy and simple as, hey, are you doing okay? Do you want to talk about some things? Do you want to meet after school to just talk through something that might be bothering you? Just that simple act of caring could completely transform somebody's day or even save their life. Step two, be proactive. As teenage bystanders, you have so much more power than you know. If you know or suspect someone's going through any type of abuse or violence, offer to talk through some possible steps of action they could take, like calling a domestic violence hotline or talking to someone they trust and respect. But, I know probably every single teenager in this room has seemingly heard this line seven, seven million times. Talk to a teacher, guidance counselor, and then all your problems will be solved and you'll be in good hands. I also know that this advice is of actual use about 0% of the time, and I get it. We don't like telling adults things about our lives because we don't want people to talk and word to get spread. And that's completely valid. I've related to that on so many occasions throughout my life. But as downright irksome as adults can sometimes be, it is really important that we let someone know. It's too important of a subject for you to be held back by concerns about privacy. So whether it be a reliable aunt, uncle, grandmother, parent, anyone, make sure to tell someone so that if something severe were to happen, you wouldn't be the only one handling the situation. Step three, check in. And if this sounds familiar, it's because it is. It's exactly the same as step one. Don't just lend a hand once and then leave. It's just not going to cut it. Because if you do that, chances are the situation is just going to slide right back down to where it started. But if you're thinking, well, it's not my job to try to fix someone's life, you're also right. But come on, if you have 30 minutes or more a day to scroll through Instagram or check Snapchat or send 300 Snapchat pictures of your uh, ceiling lamp, I'm pretty sure you have five minutes to check in with someone who's struggling. It's the same exact concept as starting a conversation. Just say, hey, I hope you're doing okay. If you want to talk, I'm here. It's easy. We've got this. 
And really, no one could have said it better than the New Yorker, who said, when I make eye contact for the first time, I want it to be with the right person. So just to review, step one, start a conversation. Step two, be an active bystander. Step three, don't just dip in and dip out. Unglue your eyeballs from all the endlessly riveting memes and Fortnite videos and actually take a minute to interact with someone. But the most important thing to remember is that when we talk about it, it's hard, but everybody benefits. Don't kid yourself to think that this isn't happening around you. No matter how pretty, how affluent, how well manicured your town might be, it is happening in all communities. So whether you're a teen like me, a teacher here at CCHS, a parent, or anything in between, I encourage all of you to reach out, start a conversation, and go out there and seize the awkward. Thank you very much.